In 2013, the FBI arrested an executive of French industrial conglomerate Alstom, Frédéric Pierrucci, when his plane arrived at the New York's JFK International Airport. He then was charged with bribing Indonesian officials to win a power plant contract. His case ran parallel with the acquisition of U.S. company General Electric of Alstom's power and grid businesses. With limited help from Alstom, Berucci pleaded guilty in the U.S. and spent over two years behind bars and three more years on bail. Five years later, Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou got arrested, falling victim to the U.S. long-arm jurisdiction. Of course, now she has returned to China without pleading guilty to fraud charges, a totally different result, some say, from Pierucci's case. So what are the similarities and differences between the two cases? What could companies and countries do to avoid being the prey for U.S. prosecution? Frederick Pierucci, the co-author of the book, The American Trap, talked to me in an exclusive interview. What do you make of the latest development with uh, Ms. Meng Wanzhou, the eldest daughter of uh, uh, Ren Zhongfei, founder of Huawei? Well, first of all, uh, I wish her a nice return to your to her home country. Uh, I think this is the end of a, a very long uh, period for her, which was uh, should have been very stressed. So obviously, uh, this is a very uh, positive outcome for everybody, um, and. Uh, it shows that uh, when uh, the state uh, is taking this thing into its own hands, you know, it can help a lot in those kind of uh, cases. So for me, this is, uh, I see this as a very huge win for China uh, because it's really the first time that uh, a country stand up to the uh, long arm jurisdiction of the United States in such a way. Mm. Fred, uh, she did not plead guilty but she did use a DPA. I mean, you have been going through all these ups and downs. Tell us more about what does that mean? Well, it means uh, uh, that uh, she didn't uh, plead guilty of uh, the counts that uh, she was uh, uh, pursued for. So she uh, uh, admitted to a statement of facts. So she recognized some facts, but she did not plead guilty. So this kind of, uh, of uh, agreement, different prosecution agreement, usually it's uh, reserved for corporation, not for individual. Uh, it's very, very unique that an individual can enter into a different prosecution agreement with uh, the Department of Justice. In fact, for instance, in all Foreign Corrupt Practice Act uh, cases, I have never seen such a, such a thing. So uh, it shows that uh, the, the negotiation has been very, very uh, tough and that the Department of Justice has really bent a lot to, uh, to accommodate this kind of uh, affair agreement. So basically it means that uh, uh, she, um, she has not pled guilty, so she's not uh, recognized as guilty. Um, and it means that if uh, she abides to the term of the different prosecution agreement, the United States are going to uh, cancel the indictment against her uh, in one year from now, in December of 2022. Mm. But do you think there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, areas up to interpretation? Would uh, different things be interpreted differently that would have a huge impact on the eventual result, Fred? No, no. When you, look, when you read the different prosecution agreement, it's very straightforward. Uh, as I said, this is uh, usually used in corporation uh, cases. And uh, 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 unless you have extraordinary circumstances, you know, this is just a formality. And in this case, you know, when you read it, you know, for me, it's just going to be a formality. Mm. Fred, your fate was a very different one. Unfortunately, you had to plead guilty in order to get out of things. Let me ask you about your settlement. How would you compare what happened to you with the latest development? Well, uh, I wasn't offered like uh, she was offered uh, to sign a different prosecution agreement. So the only thing that I was offered uh, is to sign a, a plea agreement. 
for instance, it's the same thing. I cannot say that I was not guilty. So I will not ever say publicly that I'm not guilty. Uh, uh, I am guilty. Uh, and um, this, uh, this uh, plea agreement is what is usually signed for, for physical pe people who are indicted by the, in the United States. So in my case, uh, I had to sign this, uh, uh, this plea agreement after four and a half months in a high security prison. So I was not um, like uh, she was in a third country. I was in the United States and I was uh, sent directly to a high security prison where I had to spend four and a half months there before signing the plea agreement. And in total, uh, I spent 25 months in, in, uh, in prison in the United States. So uh, by uh, uh, the fact that she was arrested in Canada um, and that the fact that the US asked Canada to, for her to be extradited to the United States meant that she was uh, not in, uh, in custody or she was released really rapidly from custody and she was on home, home uh, uh, arrest and which is a, a much different uh, case. Mm. And that makes a huge difference, of course, Fred. But I know that you were struggling so much throughout the process from the day when they tried to catch you uh, with unfounded uh, circumstances uh, to the day that you left the prison. Tell me more about how you struggled and what eventually led you to make the decision that you did? Well, um, I didn't have the chance to have uh, my company support like she had, and I didn't have the chance to have my country support like she had, okay? So after a few months of incarceration, I uh, realized that I was really alone and that uh, if I wanted to avoid spending the last uh, 15 years in prison in the United States, I had to do the choices that I made. So uh, this is a huge difference. What I have seen in the uh, Huawei case is that um, the whole company was behind her from the beginning to the end. And uh, also uh, diplomatically, uh, China probably did a lot of things to uh, come to this kind of, uh, of agreement. Um, what you have to remember is that my case occurred in 2013 and 2014. At that time, the world was not such, uh, so aware of uh, the longer legislation of the United States. It was, uh, there had been a few cases before uh, the Alstom case, but those cases uh, were unnoticed by most of the, of the people. So even in France, we had to wait until we had the Alstom case uh, so uh, in order to change the French anti-corruption law to protect French company uh, and so on. But before that, you know, it was um, it, it, it was really not de detected by uh, by anybody. So um, Mrs. Meng case came in 2018, and uh, by that time, the world knew a little bit more about uh, uh, how the U.S. is using the law as an economic weapon. So mm. I think the country was was probably uh, more ready to fight back. Mm. Fred, one of the things that you had similarities with her case is that individuals are being used as patron in a way or hostage, quote unquote, against a company that a country finds problems with for one reason or another. Now, how, how do you see the U.S. Countries, as a country's approach, the legal approach by the state toward individual like yours? Well, um, there's been a, a big change uh, in the way the US justice system has been working um, since uh, basically the beginning of the year 2000, basically after 9-11. Okay. Uh, after 9-11, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, laws passed in, uh, in the US uh, to uh, basically to be able to to uh, monitor what citizens were doing, monitor what foreign companies were doing. So, you know, basically what you have seen with uh, Mr. Snowden uh, statements and books. Uh, so uh, from the, from 9/11 up to now, the U.S. judicial system has changed a lot. Now you are in front of what we call. Uh, super prosecutors who have a huge power to basically 
propose deals, negotiate deals, and so on. So now we are in, in what we call a negotiated justice system. Uh, basically, I have a corporation or individual have to negotiate with the prosecutor if they want to avoid very long uh, uh, penalty, very heavy penalties or very long uh, prison time. So now out of 100 people, for instance, who are indicted in the United States, 90 90 plead guilty and and uh, the 10 who go to trial you know uh, 8.5 loses so you have what we call a conviction rate of 98.5 percent when you are indicted in the united states so this is very very high uh, percentage as you will, you will uh, recognize so therefore uh, uh, companies individuals usually have no choice now and the judges are becoming what we call stamp judges Basically, they just put a stamp on what has been negotiated between a prosecutor and a corporation or between the prosecutor and an individuals. Uh, that's why you, you see them, uh, you don't see a, any more real trial in the United States for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. For economic uh, reasons, for instance, uh, since, for instance, the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act has been enacted and has, has, been, has became, became uh, extraterritorial in 1998, no company went to trial. To, to fight back on the Department of Justice. So this is a very now uh, strange way of doing justice now. Mm. What do you make of this situation? Well, um, by, uh, by uh, having put in place laws which are extraterritorial in nature, you know, because I, when you use the US dollar or when you use uh, uh, internet um, tools which are connected to the United States, you are on the US law. So uh, it means that the US law now is applying to every company who basically is trying to do international uh, business. So um, what countries are starting to do, they are starting to now react to this extraterritoriality application of the US laws by strengthening their own uh, domestic laws. For mm. instance, in France, we have put a, a counter law to, to the United States law on, 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 uh, on uh, corruption. Uh, so now each country is starting to harm, uh, harm itself with their own law to counter uh, the extraterritoriality of the US laws. I remember, Fred, in your book, uh, you suggested very clearly about the, the zigzagging road you went through in order to be where you are today. Uh, tell me more about how helpless an individual could be, but at the same time, how much an individual could help themselves. Yes, uh, my case was very uh, unusual because um, the lawyer who was appointed to defend uh, me was appointed by my company. And, and uh, mm -hmm. there was a big conflict of interest uh, because my company was also fighting his own case against the Department of Justice. So therefore, I, I didn't have the chance to have a lawyer who was really uh, fighting for me. I felt very rapidly that uh, basically I was on my own, that the company was not supporting me, that my lawyer was not really working for me, that the French state was absent completely. So then you, you're left alone with your family, a uh, very, very close uh, member of your family, and you try to find a, a way out. So what I did, uh, I guess a lot of people would have done the, the, the same thing, because when you are pushed to the limit, uh, you always find resources to, to bounce back. I remain optimistic because, you know, I, 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 uh, well, I had a lot of support, surprisingly, from within the prison because I saw that my case, it was not unique. I saw in this prison a lot of other people who had very similar situation as mine. They're also coming from different countries? Yes, of course, yes. Coming from, uh, from um, Greece, uh, from Russia, from uh, Italy, from other European countries, from China, from Vietnam. So I saw a lot of people in those jails, you know, uh, basically fighting very similar cases as, uh, as mine. So that helps uh, quite a lot. And then the second thing which helped a lot is that in, in, in prison, the worst thing is to be bored because if you get bored, if you sleep all day, you know, you're not going to, to, uh, to be able to rebound. So mm -hmm. what I did is that I did as if I was going to the office every day. So I woke up early and then I started to sit uh, with a pen and a piece of paper from eight o'clock in the morning to 8 uh, p.m. in the evening, like if I was going to the office. 
And then, of course, outside, I had my family and, and, uh, and a few people who were really, really also helping, helping me a lot. I remember Miss Meng after she knew she could go back to China. She talked about the past almost two and a half years as absolutely disruptive moment of her life. But she also talked about every cloud has its own silver lining. If I understand what you just said, it seems that you are reaching similar conclusions. Yeah, I think she, she was uh, amazingly courageous also to, to continue to fight back. Uh, and uh, yesterday's result is really amazing. Uh, so um, I think she, was, she did, uh, she did uh, the right thing uh, not, to, not to give up. Uh, those two and a half years have been also very, very complicated for her, for a uh, family, for her father, for everybody. Uh, so I, I think it's an, an amazing result. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, no European country will say this, but everybody deep down f should feel grateful to what has, is happening here, because it's really one of the first time that a country is really standing up to the United States to stop their... Uh, this uh, craziness of long arm jurisdiction. So, uh, in fact, this will benefit a lot of other countries, providing they have the courage to do the same thing, you know, stand up uh, and fight back. Uh, so, uh, let's see what happens. But this is uh, probably uh, going to, hopefully, going to be a turning point. Now, it's not, it doesn't mean that everything will be uh, easier now because I think the United States will not stop. Uh, at using their, uh, uh, their law as an economic weapon, but at least, you know, uh, now we see that, you know, uh, they could get some response to this.